really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Design for Drupal, how you doing today? Okay, I was a little worried this is a room with decaf, decaf drinkers, so that's uh, <laughs> so exciting to see. Uh, so my name is Ethan Marcotte. Um, I'm Beep on Twitter or at RWD if you care more about responsive design than GIFs, um, which is, <laughs> that's your choice to make, uh, no judgment. Um, but today I'd like to tell you a few ways that I think that responsive design is starting to move beyond our devices. To do so, I wanted to start by telling you about an image I recently saw on the internet, because I'm a professional. <laughs> but I think this is actually a rather special image. This image was created in 2012 by a history professor named Ben Schmidt. And I think if you're actually able to see the screen, I think you might agree with me that it's actually quite lovely. It's sweeping, it's moving, it's ephemeral. To me, it almost feels like a snapshot of smoke. But the thing is, this isn't just some pretty bit of abstract fluff that somebody cooked up in Photoshop, a little bit of abstractionist sketching that somebody did in Illustrator. You see, Professor Schmidt actually specializes in visualizing data, more specifically so that it can help him better understand his field of study, which is the history of the 19th century. So what Professor Schmidt did was that he took two centuries worth of ocean journeys, plotted each one of them, traced them out, and then overlaid them on top of each other. So the result is what you might see on the screen in front of you. Over 200 years of humanity's maritime exploration collapsed into a single frame, compressed into a single image. Now personally, what I find even more moving, if you'll pardon the terrible dad joke, is the time-lapse video of that same image being created in real time by a computer, uh, basically showing a ship's journeys for every single month beginning in August in 1830. So if you're able to see the screen behind me, each fleeting dancing line that's moving over the map is one ship's journey, its port of origin and its destination, and the countries that it visited along that path, the countries they visited, they explored, and returned to. And in some of those cases, those ships never actually return home. I love this video, and I love this image, because I think in a very real, tangible sense, human history is founded on exploration. As a species, we're never quite satisfied with the status quo, with our current position. We crave movement, and we crave direction. And most often, we don't have either of those things. I wanted to start my talk today by talking about this video and this image, because if I was going to sum up most of the conversations I've been having with clients recently about the state of web design and about the state of responsive design, I think you could boil most of those conversations down into one simple sounding question. Where are we going? Now to be clear, there's usually a little bit of fear in the eyes of the person asking the question. <laughs> because I think if, you know, in the last few years is a really wonderful testament to how as an industry, we were caught off guard by the explosive rise of mobile, especially here in more developed markets. And I choose the word explosive very carefully because I think that growth has been nothing but explosive. Mobile is still exploding even today. There are some 8 billion mobile devices estimated to be in use worldwide. And while tablet computing isn't the newest kid on the block and we're some years out from its dawn now, it still floors me even today that in 2011 alone, 80 new tablet devices entered the marketplace in one 12-month period. That's staggering to me. Which is why, given all of this churn and all of this growth, I think it's perfectly natural that our industry is trying to figure out what else might be lying for us as we move further and further beyond the desktop, and looking and experimenting with new interesting contexts like smart TVs and smart watches and other kinds of embeddable computing to figure out what screens we might be designing for in the future, or what no screens we might be designing for. So given the explosive change that we've seen just even in the last six or seven years, I think it's perfectly natural for us to ask ourselves that question, where are we going? Now, I can't answer that question. I don't know if anybody in this room could definitively answer that question. But what I do know is where I've been going over the last few years and how I've been seeing my practice change as a digital designer. And the single biggest shift that I've seen in my practice in the last few years is moving further and further away from this idea of a page as the single central organizing principle for the design work that I do on the web. And instead, I've been embracing more modular, more pattern-driven design practices, which is a theme that's been really woven throughout the entire lineup of Design for Drupal. It's really wonderful to be part of this event. 
And this has been a big shift for me, and I think you would probably agree that it's been a big shift for most of you in this room as well. Because historically, back in the day, when we were being asked to create a website, we'd begin that process by opening up a blank document in Photoshop or an Illustrator, and we'd create an abstract system of columns and rows. We'd define a grid before we did anything else. And then we'd fill that grid with stuff, with all the features, the functionality, the photography, the content that our users and our stakeholders and their audiences actually wanted to see on that website. This is what Mark Bolton describes as a very canvas-in approach to designing for the modern web. And I think now more than ever, with all the challenges that we face, we understand as an industry that our design and development process begins a level below the page. A good friend of mine, Trent Walton, talked about his transition into embracing responsive design from a place of kind of skepticism, I think he'd, he'd call it. And he talked about when he made that transition, how he traded the control he had in Photoshop for a new kind of control. And I love that he doesn't say less, but a new kind of control. One in which he could use flexible grids, flexible images, and media queries to build not a page, but a network of content that could be rearranged at any screen size to best convey a message. And I think that's a beautiful line. Not just because it's wonderfully crafted, but I can't think of a better way to describe the work that I've been doing in the last few years, that I no longer look at an interface that I'm designing and building as a page, but instead I look for all the individual design patterns and reusable pieces of design as effectively little networks of content themselves. In fact, these little reusable design patterns are effectively small responsive designs themselves. Each one of them might change and adapt at different rates to the other design patterns that they sit next to. And it's by understanding how these design patterns have their own needs and layout constraints that we can then stitch them together to build more complex and nimble responsive designs than ever before. Modular design patterns and practices have really been one of the biggest shifts in my practice as a responsive designer. Maybe even bigger than responsive design. Maybe even bigger than mobile. Modular design has really influenced the way that I think about designing for the web in so many subtle, significant ways. Let me give you one recent example. Um, some time ago, I was fortunate enough to work on a redesign of The Toast, which is an independent publication. And this is one of those projects that just, it made me into a loyal reader of the pub, because it was a really wonderful project with a fantastic team. And they had years and years of this wonderful archive of content that we had to bring into a responsive context. This is a really fun project. And if you spend any amount of time browsing through this responsive redesign, you're going to notice that, yes, there's a ton of content. But most of it's actually displayed on all of these responsive pages with just a handful of reusable design patterns. And some of those patterns are significantly more complex than some of the other ones. For example, the masthead has many, many more breakpoints than a headline might in the main content well. And it's by looking at every single one of those design patterns, not just in context, but also in isolation from each other, that we can then understand how to best stitch them together to build more pages and sections of the website than we ever could before using old page-driven approaches to designing for the web. I want to call your attention, though, to one design pattern that I think is really the workhorse of the Toast's redesign, which is something that internally we started calling the teaser. And the teaser is what you might actually think it is. It's really just promoting content from other parts of the publication to you know, sort of entice the reader to tap on it or click into it to actually read that content. Now, the teaser in its simplest form is just a headline with a link that points off to some other piece of the content. More often than not, though, that teaser is probably accompanied with a thumbnail to give it a little bit more visual heft. Sometimes the teaser might have a very prominent looking number attached to it to signify some sort of greater ranking context that it sits in in that part of the design. But the most prominent version of the teaser that you're probably going to notice first is the one that appears in the main river of content. Now, if you were to look at every single one of these pieces of design in isolation from each other, well, you'd be forgiven for thinking that they are completely different design patterns. But structurally, under the hood, they're all the same pattern. They just have some optional attributes and optional content that's stapled onto them depending on where they actually sit in the design. But they are all the same design pattern. Now that said, I do want to call your attention to the most you know, visually prominent one that you see, the, the densest version of the teaser. Because this is one of those moments in the redesign where I kind of I caught myself and reflected on the fact that the way I think about designing for the web is, has changed pretty significantly in the last few years. 
Now, when we came up with this version of the teaser as a team uh, before we presented it to the client, I kind of fell in love with a couple things about it. But the main thing that I loved about it was the subtle inversion of priorities that we'd introduced into the layout, where the most important piece of content, the headline, isn't the one that a sighted user is actually going to see first. We actually lead this design pattern off with metadata, with the byline and category, and then a comment count up in the top right. Now, if you were the design lead on the project and you handed me a comp for this little teaser and I was the front end lead responsible for building a responsive prototype of this design, back in the old days, six months ago, <laughs> I would have looked at this design and basically done a quick visual inventory of the placement of those different pieces of content, starting with the category and byline and then the comment count, third would be the headline, and then finally the summary all the way down at the bottom. So following off their order in the layout, I would try to mimic that order in the structure of the actual teaser itself, in the markup for this particular part of the design. And basically start at the byline, move at the comment count, all the way down until we actually sit at the end of the teaser. And so I started actually prototyping this out, and this, this is one of those moments where I caught myself. And I realized this wasn't the best way to proceed. You see, there's this one question that as a responsive designer, I've been trying to ask myself at pretty much every single stage of my process, which is something like this. What if someone doesn't actually browse the web like I do? I realize standing in front of a room full of relative strangers, that doesn't sound very revolutionary. Um, I'm very sorry about that. But I can't, I can't overstate how important this one question is to my design practice. This is a great way to remind myself that I need to step out of my default assumptions and biases about how people are going to be encountering the web. And more specifically, reminding myself that my view of the design I'm working on isn't necessarily representative of everyone else's experience working with that design. And again, I mention this because I do try to bring this up at every stage of my design process. If I'm the visual lead on a redesign, and I'm working on the widescreen layout of a page in Photoshop or in Sketch, Asking myself, what if someone doesn't browse the web like I do, is a great way for me in that moment to foreground the needs of the small screen user. I may not necessarily be working on these two layouts simultaneously side by side, but it's a great reminder that as I'm making design decisions at the widest breakpoint possible, I can't compromise the experience for the small screen user. So going back to our teaser pattern, this question, what if someone doesn't browse the web like I do, is a great reminder that not everybody's going to see the web as I do. And if you think about the way that I've structured this little design pattern just in my prototype, what we've effectively done is we've buried the most important piece of content, which is the headline. And imagine how disorienting the experience would be if someone's actually having this design read aloud to them in a speaking browser, and how confusing it would be to have metadata announced before they hear in the title of the article that it's associated with. So this is a great reminder for me, at least, that every responsive designer or any front-end developer who's working with a responsive design has to begin their process by designing the priority of information they're trying to deliver to the user, independent of the layout that's ultimately scaffolded around it. So with that in mind, what I could then do is go back to the design pattern and try to step back from the visual layout that we'd agreed upon as a team and really try to look at the priority of the information inside this particular design pattern. So as I've said before, I mean, the most important piece of content is actually not the category or the comment count, but instead the actual priority that we want to be leading off with is the headline. And then the second most important piece of information is the metadata, the byline and category. And then I made the decision that the third most important piece of content is actually the summary of the article and that the least important piece of content was the one that was arguably most visually prominent, which is the comment count. Now, maybe in the hallway afterwards, you and I could have a little bit of an arm wrestle debate about whether or not you would agree with this particular priority, but I felt like this was right for this design pattern. And so working off of this initial outline, what I could then do is actually go back to my pro prototype and come up with a lightly styled version of that content hierarchy that more or less met the visual direction that we were trying to go in, even though the content uh, hierarchy didn't match the final layout. So starting with the title, moving all the way down to the summary, and then you'll actually notice if you were to view source on the website, the very last piece of information is the comment count, which is actually nested inside the summary. It's quite literally the last piece of content announced inside of this particular design pattern. Now if I showed this to the client, 
I probably would have been fired because <laughs> this isn't the design they'd approved, right? This wasn't the, the solution that we as a team had argued was the best solution for this particular part of the design. But this is the foundation that we could then use to finish the experience for sighted users who were browsing in certain devices and contexts. So off this very basic looking foundation, what we could then do is surround the two lead pieces of information with some sort of containing element in the document. Let's say a, a div with a class of teaser head or what have you. And with that little extra bit of scaffolding in place, we could then apply a little bit of light flex box to the container that would basically um, announce two things. It would declare the container as a flexible box and then it would basically set uh, the flex direction to column reverse. Now, if you haven't worked extensively with Flexbox, all that really does is it acts like a little bit of a reverse of gravity inside of that container. So column reverse basically says that the byline and category will then float up to the top and the title will float down to the bottom, all without changing the underlying document structure that we agreed upon was the best way to uh, honor that information. Now, Flexbox is wonderful. If I had significantly more uh, content in there, I could be really prescriptive about the ordering with the order property, if you will. Uh, and it's really great stuff. But the problem with Flexbox is that it doesn't actually do anything for elements that sit outside of our flexible box, like the comment count. Now, ideally, what I'd like to see happen is that if a browser or device supports Flexbox, I'd like to take that comment count out of its default position and anchor it in the top right corner of this container inside this design pattern. So to figure out if the, if the browser actually supports Flexbox, I kind of had to ask the browser if it supported Flexbox. Now, when we worked on this redesign a, a year or two ago, um, what we ended up doing was basically asking a little question in JavaScript, which looks a little bit complicated, but really what it's doing is asking the browser if it supports certain uh, properties from the Flexbox specification that we know we need to leverage in the design. And if it passes that test, then there's a class of supports flex that gets appended to the HTML element at the top, which then allows us to quarantine more advanced rules only to browsers and devices that have passed our little test in JavaScript. So we could then uh, conditionally apply the flexible box layout to that containing element and then uh, change the direction of the two elements. But most importantly for our comment count, we can then conditionally take it, um, apply a little bit of absolute positioning to it, and put it in the top right corner of that box. So in other words, what we're doing is we're beginning with a baseline structure and layout that typographically moves in the direction that we want and more importantly, honors the content hierarchy we're trying to deliver to all of our users. And then we can use this as a foundation to conditionally enhance the design and take elements out of positions that may not necessarily be ideal by default from a visual standpoint, but then conditionally finish the design only to browsers and devices that actually meet the specifications that we need uh, in order to power that more advanced layout. Now, careful readers among you who have been watching the last few slides might have noticed that I've introduced a little bit of fragility in my design, which is specifically that this layout's contingent on a couple things. It's contingent on JavaScript being available to the device or browser and uh, successfully downloading and executing. And also, you know, maybe the browser just doesn't understand Flexbox. So this is fine and this worked well for the toast, but what I'm really excited is that we're starting to get the ability to ask some of these questions directly in our CSS. So responsive designers have, for the last few years, been writing media queries into our CSS, where we've actually been querying the characteristics of the device that's rendering our designs. But now we can actually start writing feature queries into our CSS using the at supports directive without having to muck around with any JavaScript. So we can say, for example, do you actually support the display flex property value pair? And if the browser answers yes, and it understands feature queries, then we can conditionally enhance the layout from there. It's a really wonderful tool. There are some uh, considerations to keep in mind, which is that it's not supported by Internet Explorer or by incredibly popular br uh, mobile browsers like Opera Mini or older versions of Android, which are still quite popular in the device marketplace. Now, maybe that's OK for the design or the uh, audience you're designing for. But regardless of the, t uh, the approach that you take, this is a nice reminder, I think, in general, that supporting a browser doesn't necessarily mean that every single device or browser gets the exact same experience. And in fact, this principle has been at the heart of every responsive design at scale over the last few years. The Guardian is a really wonderful example of this. And if you spend any amount of time on their sort of semi-responsive layout, you're gonna notice that they have these really beautifully gridded layouts on their homepage and all of their section fronts that are really tightly composed and they're really beautifully done. 
And they're also using Flexbox quite extensively to power these layouts. Here, let me give you a quick example of how this works. I want to call your attention to one design pattern in particular, which is a sort of lead story module that you'll see on, on their homepage. Now, there's a couple things to notice about this. First and foremost, um, actually, hang on. Um, you guys will excuse me. I'm just going to make one quick change here. Just, uh, just one sec. Sorry. Sorry. I don't usually do this in front of a conference audience. OK. <laughs> I like goats. Um, <laughs> so again, if we just take a look at this one particular design pattern, there's, uh, and we do a little content inventory of the elements inside of this design pattern, you know, it's very similar to what we were doing on the toast. There's some textual content that's associated with the lead story, and then there's an image that's accompanying that lead story as well, along with a footer of related content that basically is pulled from the same topical universe. Now, if you were to look at this from a visual standpoint, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the textual information for that story is the first thing that appears in the HTML. But in fact, they decided that the most important piece of content inside of this design pattern is actually the image. And that's what appears first in the markup. But the way that they're actually changing that presentation is, again, with a little bit of Flexbox. The entire design pattern, this entire module, is set to display flex. And then they're using flex direction row reverse whereas before we used column reverse on the toast. So instead of changing the display of elements around the horizontal axis, they're changing it according to the vertical axis without changing the underlying document structure. Now with this in place, with just a few lines of CSS, they're able to power all these very tightly composed grid-based layouts on their section fronts faster than they could have with floats. I think it's really extraordinarily well done. But it's also worth noting that this is a conditionally enhanced layout. Just as we did on the toast, they run a couple lightweight JavaScript tests in the browser to see if the browser understands specific Flexbox properties, like Flexbox in general, and then the Flex Wrap property in particular. And if it passes both of those tests, then some extra classes get applied to power these more complex layouts. But if that test fails for any reason, maybe the JavaScript never reaches the client, maybe it doesn't run successfully, or maybe they don't support the CSS properties needed to power these layouts, they're still left with a baseline experience that may not necessarily meet the expectations of you and I on more advanced browsers and devices, but it still allows every device and browser on the planet access to the underlying stories that are powering the Guardian's experience online. This is a wonderful example of how I think today, now more than ever, a well-crafted responsive design has to be device agnostic by default. Now, device agnostic is a very broad sounding term. You might even argue it's a little bit of a buzzword, said the guy who coined the term responsive design. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Glass houses, man. Glass houses. Um, but actually, device agnostic is a really wonderful guiding design principle. Trent Walton, who I cited earlier in my talk, wrote this really wonderful blog entry about how this guides most of the work that's done by his agency at Paravel. Because he talked about the fact that building flexible, responsive layouts is really just the first step for designing for the modern web. He basically goes to say that there's more to devices than just the size of their screens. A device agnostic approach also takes into account infinite combinations of screen resolution, input method, browser capability, and connection speed. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that sentence out loud, I get a little pit of fear in my stomach, because <laughs> that's a lot. I didn't sign up for all this when I became a web designer. But Trent actually argues that rather than running away from these challenges, we should start with them when we're designing for the modern web. Because he goes on to say that we're dealing not just with the best hardware and the best browsers, but hostile browsers. In general, browsers don't care about perfectly replicating our designs to the end user. Any number of things can go wrong. We're dealing with screens that are wider than they've ever before, but also the smallest screens we could have imagined five years ago. We're not just dealing with high, rich, stable internet access at work and at home, but also slow networks that are incredibly unreliable. And we're dealing with more input mechanisms on these devices than ever before. And Trent basically says that we begin by looking at these characteristics. And his reasoning for that is this wonderful line. Like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or on icy roads, websites should be built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. I think we should be talking more as an industry about the web's inherent variability as a medium. I've been talking for years in writing and in my conference talks and also in my design practice 
that the web is the first flexible design medium. There's really never been anything like it in the human history. But I've just recently understood in the last few years that that flexibility applies to other aspects of the user experience as well, not just to layout or to the size of the canvas that we're designing for. The network that we use on a daily basis is a wonderful example of this. The one that we use to browse the web, to publish our work, that our audiences use to access the work that we're designing is far more broadly accessed today than at any other point in its history, but it's also far slower and far more volatile than we might like to think about when we're talking about the capabilities and the qualities of good design for the modern web. A friend of mine, Scott Gell, who works at Filament Group, which is headquartered here in Boston, he said that their agency doesn't disable JavaScript when building a website just to test how a site works with JavaScript disabled. He says that we do it to test how a site works in non-ideal net and browsing conditions. And for me, at least, as a designer, the key word in that line is non-ideal. And I think this is something that we should be doing a better job of talking about as an industry, those non-ideal contexts of use. Because at least for me, in most of my client conversations, we spend a lot of time talking about the ideal cases in which people are going to be accessing our work. There's a lot of idealized terms thrown about. In fact, the three most common words that I hear on any responsive design project are mobile, tablet, and desktop. Does anyone want to take a guess at what the three least helpful words are in talking about <laughs> the quality of a responsive design? I have nothing but dad jokes for you. They're the same three words. <laughs> now, it's not that these words are bad, but it's that they're broad. And what's more, if you were to gather a room full of clients or a room full of stakeholders together and ask them to define the word mobile, you would get dramatically different definitions from every one of them. So that's why a lot of my process is actually moving past these words in early conversations with clients, because at least those words actually eclipse some very real conditions and challenges that we can and should be designing for. And so by talking about them more directly without these umbrella terms, the design ultimately benefits. So that's why I usually urge my clients to actually move past these umbrella terms and really hone in on the specific conditions and features that will cause their designs to change and adapt. So talking about the input method or methods available to a device independent of the size of the screen. We're talking about the overall speed of the network independent of the condition or quality of that network. Now generally, I mean, if I was working on a, t on a project that was very animation heavy, maybe I would add a row in here uh, mentally about the, uh, the quality of the graphics processor on the device or something like that. But, but generally speaking, a matrix like this covers most of the challenges that I have to deal with on most of my responsive projects. Because, for example, if I was going to yell out the word mobile to you, um, we've done a nice job, I think, in the last few years of moving past this idea of like the stereotypical mobile user who's like sprinting down the street, trying to check restaurant hours on their phone while trying to catch a bus at the same time. You know, I, I did that five times yesterday. It was great. Um, but we still have a little bit of conceptual baggage when we hear that word mobile. We still tend to think of a lot of features that fall along the left-hand side of the graph. You know, we tend to think of a small, touch-enabled screen that's maybe not on the best network and maybe not the most reliable network as well. But what if that mobile device is actually being used in a stationary position? What if someone's actually on an office network or on their home network, and they've got incredibly broad and stable connection to the network? That's also a mobile use case. Or what if someone doesn't actually see the screen as you and I might, and they're having data, uh, content of our pages read aloud to them by something like VoiceOver on iOS? That's also a mobile use case, and one I would argue our industry has been doing a terrible job of designing for, historically speaking. Now, that's not to say the desktop is any less problematic. We still tend to think of these very stationary devices that have a keyboard and mouse attached to them that are on uh, office Wi-Fi, and there's not a lot of movement involved as well. But what if that desktop device is actually being uh, tethered to a 3G antenna? Maybe it's connected to my phone. You know, maybe it's on hotel Wi-Fi. Here in Boston, thousands of people commute into the city every day on commuter rail trains. Every single one of them that has Wi-Fi, that's terrible. <laughs> this is also a desktop context of use, which is a nice reminder that a very fast, very performant design isn't something we should just be thinking about for mobile users. So that's why I try to urge clients to move past some of these really broad categories, because they tend to bake a lot of assumptions into what these devices can do when you're thinking about a design. Which is why, at least for us on the Toast, we spent most of our time on the project really refining the high-end responsive design you might see in your mobile device or your desktop device 
if you were to go look at it now. But we wanted to ensure that there was something usable for any device underneath that design, which is why the Toast actually begins its life in the, in the browser as a single column layout that's small screen friendly by default. And then we can conditionally enhance up into something that's a little bit more robust. So that's why I think we should look for more opportunities to design for the non-ideal contexts of use, to remind ourselves that the web is an inherently variable medium and prepare our designs accordingly. Now, I will fully cop to the fact that I've been talking about some really text-heavy layouts, right? That, the, you know, publishers like The Guardian or The Toast, you know, it's easy to talk about some of these challenges from a device context, agnostic context, but I think this applies to more interactive environments as well. Let's say you have a very complex inter interface that's dealing with a lot of really rich transactions. Maybe a certain design pattern that allows a user to make a, a series of choices and then confirm or back out of that choice might begin its life in the browser as a very simple looking set of form controls. But having that foundation in place doesn't prevent you from enhancing up under certain conditions into something that's a little bit more uh, sleekly refined and animated to meet the expectations of the modern web user. It can apply to uh, designing navigation for the web as well. Let's say by default, um, your navigation actually begins its life as a kind of skip link where somebody can tap or click on a call to action and move to the very bottom of the page where the navigation natively resides. Having that very simple and maybe kind of clunky interface as a foundation doesn't preclude you from then enhancing up from that foundation into something that, again, meets the expectations of the modern web user. So by looking for these opportunities to begin by honoring the content priority we're trying to design, we can then work to apply that kind of device agnostic thinking into, into our responsive layouts. Not just at the page level, but every single pattern that we're actually designing. And by looking at every single design pattern and asking yourself that question, what if someone doesn't browse the web like I do? The result is that your design, both at the pattern level and at the page level, is gonna be much better prepared to deal with the adverse challenges that await it on the modern web. It's going to ensure that your site or product is better equipped to deal with the web's challenging conditions. Now, having said all that, and having talked a fair bit about design and implementation, there's one little dirty secret about responsive design that we should probably talk about briefly today, which is that now, at least I feel in 2017, designing and building a responsive layout isn't the hardest part anymore. Now, that's not to say that it's easy, or that we've solved every single one of our challenges. And in fact, we're getting so many wonderful layout tools like CSS Grid and Flexbox that I mentioned before that's allowing us to do so much more from a design and layout standpoint. I'm excited about the years ahead. But as responsive design moves further and further into the mainstream, the biggest challenge that I see with many organizations that adopt it is that the biggest challenge is actually documenting and communicating how, why, and when our responsive designs actually adapt. So that's why many organizations have actually been turning to style guides as a potential answer for this particular problem. Now, maybe your team calls them style guides. Uh, maybe your team calls them pattern libraries. Unfortunately, this is one of those areas where I think the English language has completely failed us. Um, I, tend to, <laughs> you know, I tend to read the room a little bit and try to borrow the term that is most comfortable with the team I'm working with. But regardless of what you happen to call them, style guides or pattern libraries are wonderful ways to see how these design patterns actually work in isolation and then how they can be snapped together to collaborate and, be, uh, and produce a larger responsive layout from there. One of the earliest examples of this at scale was Starbucks. So they launched a responsive redesign back in 2011, and then they made the really interesting choice to make their pattern library public, which meant that anybody internal to Starbucks, but also external to the organization, could browse through this web-based interface and see how individual design patterns worked. And this was a really wonderful way to see how very simple looking patterns like headlines and links could be combined together to be made more complex all the way up into full page layouts and section layouts. It's really beautifully done. So moving a few years later, a recent favorite of mine is Ushahidi's pattern library. Now Ushahidi actually develops uh, open source software for data visualization and interactive mapping. It's a fairly robust software platform that's used globally, especially in emerging markets. <clears throat> And again, if you spend any time browsing through this pattern library, working from the beginning sections further to the right into the end, you'll see how these very simple design patterns get snapped together, are made progressively more complex, and building full layouts or full headers or interactive maps. So that's why I would actually go so far as to say that especially in recent years, a style guide or pattern library has become the de facto artifact 
that comes out of the responsive design process. And it offers many benefits to organizations who can actually invest the time and resources, not just in building a pattern library, but maintaining it over time. First and foremost is the one that I think a lot of front-end developers and designers talk about, which is that a pattern library or a style guide offers you a central shared repository for all the front-end patterns and code that go into powering your responsive layout. And that's a wonderful benefit that shouldn't be undersold. But from an organizational standpoint, it offers some real benefits as well. It helps bridge what's known as a collaboration gap. And this is a term that Airbnb used because they actually found that by starting their design process, not with traditional design tools like Photoshop and Sketch, but by actually working directly from patterns in the pattern library, design and engineering teams could actually be brought much closer together and start prototyping products and new features more quickly than they ever could have before. It can also help with onboarding new team members who need to orient themselves in your organization's visual language, and it can also help facilitate in-browser design, review, and testing. So if you have a QA utility that does visual regression tests, pointing it at a style guide that's pulling production assets that sh is shared with your website is a really great way to sort of see regressions creep into your design before they make it live. Now, if you're interested in creating a style guide or pattern library, um, well, first of all, good luck. You have a lot of work in front of you. Um, but there's actually, just, it's, it's really just a three-step process, which is not to say it's a short or easy process, but there's really three steps. You begin by inventorying all the different patterns on your layout and on your design. And then you name and organize those patterns in a clear and sensible fashion. And then you actually translate that inventory into HTML and CSS. You produce a style guide. So I just want to walk through those in turn, just to sort of see how that process tends to work. So first, we begin by creating a visual inventory of all of our patterns. Um, and everyone has a different way of doing this. But basically, for me, it begins by sort of browsing through a website. Now, this could be a website that's about to be redesigned um, or one that's about to launch. And then it basically doing a quick inventory of all the reusable design patterns that I see. I'm not looking for every single headline or every single link, but unique classes and treatments of them. Those are the design patterns that we're trying to actually honor and preserve and document. And so once I find them, basically it's a matter of actually just copying and pasting screen caps into some other document. Um, I tend to use Sketch or Keynote. Some people actually use uh, Photoshop. I met somebody once who uh, used a spreadsheet. We don't talk much. <laughs> um, but regardless of what you do, this is really just a way to get a quick info dump of all the different patterns that you have on your website that need to be documented and captured in your pattern library. Once you've got this jumble of a document in place, or a spreadsheet, if that's your thing, that's fine, um, then it's basically a matter of applying a little bit of structure to it. So what I try to do is actually try to group patterns that are like-minded together, name the categories that I find within that jumble, and then also name the patterns themselves individually. And I'm trying to do so in a way that, so that they're clear and sensible and findable, not just for me, but for anybody who's going to be interfacing with this document. Once I've done that, and I've got some order in place, then I can actually produce my style guide. Now, when we worked on the Toast, they had a very, very small number of design patterns that went into powering that whole layout. And so we basically created a single HTML document where they could see every single one of the patterns in context and also quickly access the code underneath them so that if a producer on the website needed to spin up a new page, they could uh, use this one sheet as a quick reference for them to do so. Now, this is, a, this is a static sort of copy and paste job, which I don't usually recommend. And we were able to do this with the Toast because they weren't going to be extending the design framework, and also because they had a very small number of patterns. Ideally, what you'd like to do, though, is automate this process so that your style guide or your pattern library is actually evergreen, so that as you change a pattern, it's reflected on the website and vice versa. Now, there's a significant number of autom automation tools out there to allow you to do this. One example of this is a tool called Style Guide by a company named DevBridge. And basically, this is a really wonderful little style guide generator where it works by sort of scraping your style sheet and looking for significant content inside of it and building the pattern library automatically. Now, there are a number of utilities that do something like this. Um, to be honest, the main reason I included it in my presentation is I'm a sucker for that little resizing widget you see on the screen. I'm very distracted by shiny things, and that's, that's a great example of this. But basically, tools like this work by um, you know, style sheet linters, little mini languages that you sort of um, use a significant um, syntax in your comment structure to sort of document how the patterns are structured and what they actually do. 
And there's a bunch of like little mini micro formats for this uh, sort of style sheet work. KSS is one example, style doco and style down are others. But they all basically kind of work the same way, where you're sort of describing in a significant manner a bunch of style sheet rules and what they do. And then a tool like Style Guide um, by DevBridge will actually go through your style sheet and automatically generate your pattern library. It's, uh, it's really wonderfully done. One tool that I'm very excited about is Fractal, which is uh, built by uh, ClearLeft in the UK. And this isn't really just about producing style guides. In fact, Fractal is trying to engender a kind of component-first design process. It's almost like a little miniature CMS for design patterns. So in other words, it's geared not just to uh, documenting your product, but also integrating it into other products. Fractal offers a little API so that other platforms, like your website, like native applications, can actually talk to it to get patterns directly from it and integrate it into their products accordingly. So it helps keep your pattern library and your live design or designs in sync with each other over time. Another utility that I quite like, uh, Airbnb produced this internally, and this is a utility that they call AirShots. It allows them to review patterns in context on different devices and also using different language sets. Now, they made some noise about potentially open sourcing this at some point, and I haven't heard anything else since then, but uh, I'm very excited about that. That'll be like a holiday morning because uh, it's very pretty to look at. Can't wait to play with it. Anyway, so we are really living in a golden age of instrumentation and tooling about automatically creating style guides. If you're interested in this topic, I would totally recommend you check out Susan Robertson's roundup of style guide generators on a list apart. It offers uh, many more resources out there. But I wanted to walk through this process quickly because I think as an industry, we do a really good job of talking about the first and third steps in creating a style guide. There's a lot of research and writing out there about how to manage the creation of a visual inventory of all your design patterns. And also, as you've seen, there's a significant amount of software out there to automatically create a style guide or a pattern library. But I would actually argue that the most important step of this process is the one that we talk about the least, which is the second step the clear naming and organization of all the patterns in your design uh, system. A designer I really respect, a woman named Ala Kolmatova, talked about how modularity might appear to be a simple concept at first, but actually making it work for your team requires significant effort and commitment. And she goes on to say that language is fundamental to collaboration. In short, we should begin this process with language, not interfaces. I think all is right, and what's more, this actually reminds me of a story about a boat. Now, this boat's name was the Hokulea, and it's not just a boat. It was a large voyaging canoe powered only and entirely by the wind in its sails. And in 1976, the crew of the Hokulea made a decision to take it on a very scenic but also very difficult journey. Specifically, they were going to be traveling between two points on the Pacific Ocean, between two island nations, Hawaii and Tahiti. Now, if you or I was going to fly between those two points in the ocean, it would take us almost 10 hours to reach our destination. The Hokulea did that trip in 30 days. But what was significant about that trip wasn't just where they went or how long it took them to get there, but the fact that they made that trip without the aid of any contemporary navigational technology. No compasses, no sextants, no computers, and no maps that were produced in the modern era. They were able to make this incredibly difficult and analog journey thanks to the efforts of one man, a man named Pius Mao Piailug, who was a navigator from a small island called Satawal in Micronesia. And Mao was actually schooled in traditional Polynesian navigation techniques, many of which were hundreds and hundreds of years old. And this was what the journey of the Hakalea was actually trying to honor, these navigation techniques, techniques that were based on navigating the seas by the stars, by the sun and the moon, we're on a cloudy night by the direction of the waves on the water. Now, one of the most important instruments in Mao's tradition never actually made it onto the boat with him, which is something called a star compass, which is a very, very simple looking circle of rocks and shells with a point that's fixed in the center. Now, I have a very brief video clip of Mao using the, uh, the star compass in a teaching context. I'd like to share it with you if you'll permit me. Hey. Is 
It's a really wonderful clip. I would recommend checking it out in full at some point if you're interested in learning more. But um, there's a few things that are actually happening. If you're not able to see the video, what's happening is that Mao is actually pointing at the rocks in turn, or one of his students is. And the chant that you hear is also very significant as well. You see, every single stone in the compass actually represents one constellation in the sky. And the point that's fixed in the center of the compass actually represents the boat that the navigator and his or her crew would be sitting on. And the chant that you may have heard as the video played was actually Mao naming the stars one by one, which basically helps navigators in Mao's tradition understand the sky and the boat's position relative to it. Now, this is how navigators in Mao's tradition actually learned through song, which is beautiful, yes, but more importantly, by establishing a shared common language. I think this is really wonderful, not just from a tradition standpoint, but because it establishes consistency with every single navigator who's ever taught these techniques. That consistency allows navigators in Mao's tradition to make decisions when they're out on the water in live conditions, and the stone star compass is left on the land behind them. I wanted to mention this story briefly because the biggest challenges around modular design are everything that happens after you've created your pattern library. And some of those challenges are going to include things like knowing when it's OK to reuse an existing module and when you actually need to create a new one, how to make modules distinct enough from each other to warrant inclusion in your library, or how to actually identify duplications with modules that other designers or other teams might be adding to that visual system, and so on and so forth. Some of these challenges you're going to be facing as you embrace pattern-driven design processes. And the technology that we use to create our style guides won't solve any of these problems for us. In other words, naming and language create a shared understanding among your team and your organizations around your design patterns. And that is what's going to create a more consistent design over time. I wanted to talk a little bit about language because one of the most popular terms for talking about modular design in the last few years is something called atomic design. Now, this is a metaphor and a methodology that was coined by a colleague of mine, a man named Brad Brad Frost. And if you're someone like me who barely understands web design and definitely doesn't understand chemistry, this is a really great way to sort of talk to people about how very small components get broken down into reusable bits, combined together, and progressively get more complex. So basically, in the atomic design methodology, you begin with atoms, which are single HTML elements. And then you combine atoms together, and they get progressively more complicated. And then you move all the way up into full templates and full page layouts. Well, what some teams and organizations have found, that while this is a beautiful metaphor and a wonderful methodology for talking about modular design, in practice, it actually introduces some potential complications when we're trying to co uh, collaborate together. Let's, uh, let's do a quick example. Let's say we're trying to do a visual inventory of a responsive design we've just finished. And let's start at the top of this responsive layout that we see here, um, created by some little startup I've never actually heard of. Um, so let's say we have this search pattern at the top of the page. And this is a really wonderful pattern, right? It has a number of really interesting things in it. On wider screens, it's a completely flexible element. But on smaller screens, you have to tap or click on an element to reveal it. And there's that lovely little bit of animation. So this is a wonderful design pattern that we have to find a home for inside of our pattern library. So if we're borrowing the atomic design metaphor, we can quickly see that this is not an atom. It's not a single HTML element. But it's also not a full template or a full page. It's, somewhat that it's something moderately complex, which means it's either a molecule or an organism to work with this metaphor. Unfortunately, the guidelines around atomic design aren't very clear about where moderately complex elements like this would fall. I want to be very clear. This is not a life-threatening issue. You know, every single person in this room could probably answer this question, right? We could probably find a home for this somewhere in this ranking context. And we could all decide this is a molecule or this is an organism. But the challenge is, is that everyone in this room wouldn't agree. We probably all have a different understanding of what a molecule or an organism is. It introduces a potential, in other words, especially in larger teams, for kind of organizational friction. It introduces confusion over terms, which could then slow down our ability to collaborate and ship. Now, this is not necessarily an insurmountable problem. Some organizations actually hack around this by introducing a kind of translation layer on top of these terms. Dan Mall talked about this in the context of his uh, redesign for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And he said that the team actually ended up making a group glossary for our project. 
this is the definition for an atom. This is the definition for a molecule, so we all knew how to talk about these things. But that's not always an option, especially at scale. Trent Walton talked about this in the context of a larger process that he was working on with a big client. And he said that the team actually struggled to map components to an atomic classification, which made collaboration within the project difficult. We'd pause to recalculate proper classification before talking about a component. John O'Harrington, who runs a small creative agency, basically said that his team totally bought into the core concepts of atomic design, but when it came down to what each of those components were called, it didn't make sense to them. It was too hard to relate these terms to the overall big picture. Stories like these, and the stories that I hear from my clients that have had similar issues with this, are a really wonderful reminder that a style guide's success or failure often hinges on the words that we use to talk about it. Now, regardless of the terms that you use, whether it's atoms and molecules, or components, or blocks, ensure that every single member of your team or your client's team has the same level of understanding about what those words mean that you do. Now, maybe for you and your team, atomic design provides that perfect level of clarity and understanding, and if so, that is wonderful. But what I've seen in my practice over the last few years is that instead, companies and organizations are actually spending the time to design a language system to organize their design patterns. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, a good style guide embraces language and metaphors that are meaningful to your organization, and more specifically, to the people responsible for maintaining it. Now, if you take one thing away from this, uh, this talk, is that I would highly recommend you go check out Ala Matova's wonderful article exclusively dedicated to this particular problem, the language of modular design. And this is kind of a reaction to the fact that as an industry, we've been talking about the visual inventory process as something that a sole designer or a sole developer does. So they sort of scurry off to a cave and they come back with a fully formed uh, visual inventory and pattern library. But rather than having one designer or dev working through the UI, Allah actually argues that this should be a collaborative, team-wide exercise. You know, so basically, as a group, you review every single module in your design system, and then you name things collaboratively based on their high-level function. And she goes on to say that in the process of naming an element, you work out the function of that element as a group and reach an agreement. But the real benefit here is that it's not so much about giving something a great name, although you should absolutely strive to do that but it's the fact that you've all agreed on that name together. An effective name determines how the element will be used and helps ensure that it will be used uh, consistently by everyone. She actually found that the benefit to doing things like this by making these processes more collaborative is that it can expose redundancies in your design system. And specifically, during the course of one of these reviews, Alice's team actually uncovered a potential conflict. They had one module that had been designed to promote online courses, and then another module that had been designed by a different team to promote discussion. Now, if you're sighted you're, and you're able to see the screen, <coughs> you can see that both of these modules have a very similar style. But more problematically, they actually had a very similar function. Um, so basically, that collaborative review helped kick off not just uh, finding that redundancy, but also a discussion about the best possible replacement. And they could kick off a discussion about their shared high-level purpose, which is to focus the user's attention on one particular action. So with that in place, the entire team could then come up with a recommendation for how to collapse these redundancies into one design pattern. And so this new replacement module that they called Billboard was much stronger than the two modules that it uh, replaced. It was no longer restricted by the position on the page or by the content inside the module. But what was actually more important than that was that the shared high-level function of this module was now shared by everyone in the team. So they all understood how and why that module was supposed to be used. So ultimately, a good style guide focuses on the content and functionality that those patterns uh, support. And there are a bunch of different ways that you can make this a more collaborative exercise. When we worked on the toast, we made this much more collaborative through a good content strategy process in the beginning. So Karen McGrain and Eileen Webb actually began with a, um, an extensive uh, content modeling process but they looked at the existing Toast website and broke it into a content model that outlined the different content types that were published by the Toast, like long-form essays, advice columns, and interviews. And with those high-level uh, types in place, what they could then do is dig down into each one of them and outline the specific uh, content fields that supported each one of those larger types. And with that in place, they could then translate some of those fields into some very rough UX wireframes that were then handed off to the designer to build full-page layouts. 
But the benefit that we had when we actually came time to build the responsive design was that since the client was intimately involved in this modeling process, we could actually use language borrowed directly from it to ensure the patterns were named in a way that was clear and sensible to them when they were going to be inheriting the website. Because ultimately the goal is to integrate your design language into your company culture. And Ala outlines some very specific benefits to this in her wonderful article that I would totally recommend you check out. But if I was going to presume to add one thing to Ala's list, is that if you can integrate your design language in your company culture, it can actually help your entire team start thinking in terms of design principles. Because in the last few years, we have seen a ridiculous amount of change as we've moved from pages to more pattern-driven practices. And it's design principles that are going to help us manage not just the complexity we deal with today, but the challenges that are waiting for us in the future. It's going to help us down the road to find patterns that we don't, need that today, that we don't know that we need today, but, or to de design for devices that haven't even been invented yet. Thankfully, there have been some responsive organizations that have been talking about how design principles have been helping them do that. Vox Media is maybe one of the more visible examples of this. Their, um, their website and all of their sub-brands have been more or less responsive since day one. And many of them actually draw from a very similar well of patterns. Even though they look dramatically distinct on every single one of their sub-publications, they're beautifully architected and pulling from common patterns for the most part. So the Vox product team actually talks about how when they're designing new patterns or a new website, they actually have some fairly well-articulated design principles that help them do that very thing. And their design principles include things like uniqueness. Is this design pattern actually necessary or can we use an existing pattern instead? Is it reusable enough not just to be used on different pages, but also on different publications as well? Is it clear in language and in motion? And not just clear to end users who are going to be browsing through these websites, but also clear internally to designers and developers who are going to be extending these patterns in the future. Is it responsive enough to work on different classes of devices? And is it also accessible enough to people who may not browse the web like you and I do? Airbnb actually talks about their core design principles as solving a similar problem, although they have different principles internally, which are unified, universal, iconic, and conversational. Unified and universal, at least for them, define the system's approach that they apply when defining patterns. Does it feel part of a greater whole? Does it work across devices? Iconic and conversational, however, help define the character of the system for them. It's unique human qualities that tie back to their community and brand values. The benefit to ultimately articulating design principles is that by combining them with design patterns, you've actually elevated it just from a document of front-end snippets and code and into a fully formed design system. In other words, a kind of compass that's going to, design, to guide your responsive design over time. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, none of us in this room can answer that question, where are we going? We don't know necessarily. But the one thing that I do know, at least in my work in the last few years, is the web doesn't evolve in a single straight line. You know, hardware is not consistently getting better. Browsers aren't perfectly upgraded every time. And as we move further and further beyond the desktop, it's worth checking some of our assumptions about the direction we think the web might be going. Because yes, absolutely, mobile has been explosive, and it's changed the way that we think about designing and browsing the web. But it's also worth noting for, um, at the same time that for the most part, mobile growth has, by and large, not come at the expense of desktop traffic. It's been additive rather than reductive. And while tablet computing is still very exciting, both market analysts and tablet manufacturers themselves have been actually seeing a bit of a softening, if not an outright decline, of the tablet ecosystem. And there has been a significant amount of experimentation and investment in trying to figure out what exactly lies for us beyond the desktop. But there hasn't been one single candidate that's emerged with the same level of viability and excitement that mobile did back in the day. And what's more, I'm being presented on a daily basis in my design practice with a reminder that our industry's definition of a smartphone is entirely too narrow. You know, I've been watching a lot of the photography that's coming out of the Syrian refugee crisis, which is the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. And one of the through lines throughout all these photographs are smartphones. But they're smartphones that don't look like the ones that you and I might have in this room. They're much cheaper, they're lower powered, but they're actually just as capable as the browsers that you and I use. They're capable of connecting to the same sites and services that we use, that we design. And so it's a reminder, at least for me, that it's heartening, I think, that our industry has been turning to this phrase, the next billion, 
as we start thinking about what design needs to be in the next few years. That the next billion people to be coming online aren't going to be coming from uh, developed markets like the US and Western Europe. They're going to be coming from emerging markets that we haven't been continually uh, thinking about in the past. A designer and researcher named Ben Chalmina actually says that this is the greatest challenge facing our industry today, that some of the next billion to come online are taking boats across the Mediterranean, the South China Sea, and elsewhere. They will have smartphones. So I think we need to begin today as our teams actually start creating well-formed design principles and marrying those design principles to pattern-driven, device-agnostic, responsive sites. That's going to ensure that our sites and our services and products will be able to move beyond our devices and be accessible to theirs. So let's design for them. Because if we're looking for stars to set our ship by, can't think of better ones than those. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Um, we, do have, we do have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, I don't know. If, uh, I'll run around with a mic if we need to. Oh, I can repeat questions too. Yeah. yeah. Anyone? Come on. <laughs> Reese, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Favorite Ask gifts. the man a question. <laughs> I'll be out in the hallway. Oh, is there a hand? Oh, yes. Hi. Hi. It's not a question, it's just, wow, that was inspiring. That's <laughs> very kind of you, thank you very much. It's, it's a real honor to be here. This is a wonderful event, so it's, yeah, right here. Uh, just wondering maybe if you could elaborate on how your clients receive some of this information and how much, how much um, learning or teaching does it take from your part to get a client who maybe we could say typically doesn't really understand our processes or what we do. Sure. How do they, how easy is it for it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think it, it really depends on who's in the room in general. Um, generally speaking, like more and more of my processes, if I'm, you know, as I mentioned, like a pattern library really is kind of the end point for most of the designs that I work on. Um, so I try to spend a lot of upfront time talking about the audience for that pattern library because that changes from organization to organization. Maybe it is something that's gonna be solely referenced by a front end design team. Maybe it is something that's gonna be referenced by marketing and communications to a certain extent as they're planning for new products in the future. Talking about who's gonna be accessing it and why um, and how are, are some of the ways that I start trying to figure out like how we can make that document as accessible to those audiences. Maybe it's gonna end up having a bit more of a technical skew. Maybe it does need to have some higher level language as well. Um, a good example, I think, of a, a really cross-device pattern library that I didn't include in this because of time is uh, Salesforce, uh, their lightning design system. Uh, because that's something that's trying to speak to their entire corporation that you know, they have a significant number of products that they're trying to support with this design system. But it also has some really like, high-level guiding design principles that I think have some value to less technical teams as well. So there's some examples out there as well. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, what are your thoughts on the large screen? You mentioned many different uh, sizes, but. The large screen, yeah. That's, um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that uh, designing for wide screens is, um, it, it, it's, it absolutely has value. Um, I, I, try to, I try to be as mobile focused as possible during my design process, um, because I think especially with the way that audiences are moving these days, like optimizing for widescreen feels like a little, uh, yeah, right. Oh, for TVs? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I haven't worked on, on too many uh, like fixed screen displays in recent years, but um, you know, I think that that's something that, um, you know, there's actually more overlap between like mid-sized devices and you know, large TVs than you know, from a resolution standpoint, they tend to overlap a fair bit from a browser standpoint. Um, but yeah, that's something that I'm, I have sort of work on on a project by project basis, definitely. Thank you. Oh, hi. Hi. So, so, so some of the principles you talked about, modularity, um, not duplicating. Um, I don't think you specifically mentioned maintainability, but I think you'd agree that that's important. Sure. The, th these are things that are important in design of computer languages. Absolutely. In, in software design. Um, how are these ideas being traded back and forth between front-end developers, back-end developers? 
architects, which is where yeah. we, we got some idea of, of uh, design patterns as, as currently right. used in software design. Want to say more about that? Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, the web's always been this weird industry, at least in my time, because we keep borrowing metaphors from other you know, much older design disciplines. Um, so yeah, Christopher Alexander's pattern language is a really big influence on how we're talking about design patterns now to a certain extent. Um, I think I think we're very much still in like the beginning of this process because we've been talking about design patterns just as like reusable front end code rather than like here's how we're solving a problem. And like for example, um, something that I've been advocating for a little bit more is actually talking about intended areas of use for these patterns and having more like um, more descriptive language around how and why to make some of these decisions, basically, and bake them into the pattern libraries, rather than just thinking about them as like a front-end uh, deliverable. Um, so yeah, it's early days yet, but I'm kind of excited to see where the industry's been going. Thank you. We have one more back here. One more. How do you see that education, particularly at um, high school, community college, workforce development kinds of things, should change to reflect this, because these are a wonderful new concepts? Sure. That's a wonderful question. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I'm equipped to answer it, as I'm not an educator. Um, but um, I can speak for myself as a designer. Like, I don't, I don't begin by like, just designing a login form and then just designing a masthead. Like, I still need to see these design patterns in context, in the context of a larger page. Um, but you know, my process has started moving f more toward like looking for those areas in a design that can be reused. Um, so I think that's that. That for me at least feels like the next transitional step is like building a page layout. That's wonderful. But let's talk about how. Or you've got a headline that's sized to 34 pixels and one that's sized to 33 pixels. They're both in a serif font. Can we talk a little bit about maybe there's some some overlap there and how do we streamline those patterns accordingly? And I think this is something that most designers do anyway, you know, just naturally. They look for those opportunities to make things repeatable, to make them as generic as possible. I think we're just talking about formalizing it a little bit as well. But thank you. That's a great question. And thank you, everyone, for, for all the questions. That's really Thanks, fantastic. Everyone. Another round of applause for Ethan. So we're now going to raffle off signed copies of Ethan's book. So if, you, if your name is called, come down and sign your name on this paper, and then come to registration, we'll give you the books. And then we have a few more raffles. Whoever volunteered to take the picture, could you come down if you're here? Thank you. Yeah, and also if everybody could go to the middle while we're doing the raffles, that would be great. Thanks. OK, we're going to do eight of Ethan's book.